Tim, the greatest challenge to free will today is claimed to be from brain science, particularly the Libet experiment. As a philosopher, what is the, the sequence of logic that is behind the claim that brain science can eliminate free will? Let's start by sketching the abstract uh, design of the Libet experiment, if, if you will. So Libet uh, tells people to raise their hand or perform some simple bodily action when they feel like it within a certain period of time. So they're given that instruction, uh, and then he measures what's going on in their brain. He, he, and he identifies a readiness potential, um, and one can quibble about the time, but, but let's leave those details to one side. That ramps up somewhere like 550 milliseconds before the time of the action. About half a second. Half a second, yeah. Uh, but he's also given them a clock, specially designed clock, and he asks them to monitor their own phenomenology of agency their own experience of initiating that action. Um, and people say something like 200 milliseconds before the action, that's when they decided to act. About a fifth of a second. Exactly. So we've got two gaps. We've got a, a gap, a very short gap, between the action, the zero point, point of when the action begins, and the, the, the report of the subject of decision to act. And then we've got another gap, and this is the second gap that people worry about. Um, between the, the conscious decision and the readiness potential ramping up. Which I'm not conscious of. Which you're not conscious of, arguably. Okay. Um, you can be conscious of the stars and the stars you know, of, of a supernova. Okay. And the supernova occurred many, many millennia ago, but you're conscious of it now. So you can be conscious of events that happened in the distant past. Okay. Maybe you, could, maybe you are conscious of the readiness potential, even if it predates your awareness by 300 milliseconds. Okay. Let's go to the logical flow. So right. given the Libet experiment, right. Right. how as a philosopher so, does the argument go? So here's how I reconstruct the argument. Um, the first premise will be something like this. Um, Libid actions, Let, let's call the actions that one performs here, the raising of one's arm, in this experimental content, libid actions. So libid actions are initiated not by a conscious decision, but by the readiness potential. Second premise might be something like so that's this. That's the first premise. That's the first premise. Second premise, if an action is not initiated by a conscious decision, it's not free. Okay. So that's a conceptual claim about what free will involves. Yes. Initiation by a conscious decision. Mm -hmm. um, therefore... Those two, we put those two premises together, we get the conclusion that these actions are not initiated by free will. They're not involved free will because they're not initiated by conscious decision. And then you've got to make a generalization, which is also interesting. And not many people talk about this in connection with the Libet experiment. You've got to say, because these actions, these hand wavings, um, hand raisings, don't exemplify free will, then we don't have any free will at all. They do. Exemplify. Well, they don't. I mean, so the, here's how the Libet argument would go. These actions don't exemplify free will because the readiness potential... But, but, but they do them. exemplify all kinds of actions that would be represented by free will. Well, that's, that's the claim. Oh, right, right, right. So they're, they're gen, that, that's right, they're um, representative. Right, um, right. So, so uh, the use of exemplification there is perhaps not the right word. But because these actions are not freely willed, and these are representative right, of right, free, right. free will actions, of those actions we think we have free will over, right. then Libet wants to draw the conclusion, um, yeah. or at least people who think Libet shows that we don't have any free will will draw the conclusion that we never have free will. So there's a generalization from these experimental right. actions to actions in general. So you have basically t two premises, yep. and you make a conclusion that the Libet experiment that shows there's no free will. Yeah. Then that's the then that conclusion's the, the number three. Now number yeah. four is then you generalize right. from the Libet movement to all kinds of decisions, right. and therefore all kinds of that's right. decisions have no free that's right. will. And if you want to resist the skeptical slide here, there's there's right. two or three places to get off the bus. Okay. Right. So one place to get off the bus is to say, Libet's shown that these actions are not freely willed. You could grant him that, but say there are important dissimilarities between raising your hand, which is a very automatic, mm -hmm. it's a very familiar kind of action, the sort of thing we often do without thinking about it, 
you know, you're deep lost in thought and you find yourself twitching or bouncing your foot up and down. Um, you might say, yeah, those, those are not freely willed, but they were never our paradigms of free will. I mean, our paradigm case of free will might be the kind of Sophie's Choice case where you're deciding what to do in these morally laden decisions and you've got time to reflect and to deliberate. So you might say there's a very important difference between certain kinds of actions which we think are freely willed and the and libid actions. That's one place to get off the bus. So that's the generalization. That's from the, the generalization experiment to all the, yeah. the, the true yeah. so, so-called yeah. things of free will. So you okay. might say he, that's a hasty generalization. Okay. An earlier place to get off the bus would be to simply say uh, it's not built into our notion of free will that freely willed actions must be initiated by a conscious decision, at least on a certain understanding of what a conscious decision is. So Libet's thinking, if you have the readiness potential that occurs here, and you have the what he calls the W moment, that's the moment that you're aware of the decision to act. It's the moment that people report it as, I initiated the action then. Mm-hmm. He's assuming that these must be um, that, that the readiness potential caused the action um, either directly or indirectly via causing the, the W event, the event that you report. Um, and they can't be the same thing because they occur at two different times. Right, sure. But of course one could say, well, a conscious decision, here, here's a way of hearing that phrase, it's a very strange phrase, is a decision that you're conscious of. That seems to me a perfectly natural thing of what we might mean when we say I consciously decided. So the conscious awareness might occur at the W point, but the thing that you're conscious of might have occurred earlier. But that was not conscious. Well, uh, it wasn't conscious then, but you became conscious of it. So maybe this does exemplify a conscious decision under one way of thinking about what a conscious decision was. So he's thinking a decision must be inherently conscious, intrinsically conscious. But if you have a relational conception of consciousness, so you say, is that rose conscious? Well, the rose is not inherently conscious. That makes no sense. But I'm conscious of the rose, or I'm conscious of the explosion. I'm conscious of my decisions. And if you can become conscious of your decisions early enough, in the space between the initiation of the decision and the action, then that gives you a kind of control. And it may be give you the kind of control that you need. Sounds like backwards causation. No, it's not. It's, as I think of it, it's not backwards causation. So you have the readiness potential. You become conscious. That's the decision, if you like. And at that moment, it's unconscious. When it occurs, it's unconscious. But you become conscious of it, and therefore it's a conscious decision. And you become conscious of it prior to the action being completed, so you've got a kind of control of it. You've certainly got a kind of veto control. You certainly have a control of it. Nobody's arguing um, that. So, But you've made the decision before you're conscious. That's right. That's right. But then it's a separate question whether that means that that decision wasn't freely willed. So maybe unconscious decisions, unconscious decisions that you later become conscious of, maybe that's consistent with a kind of free will. I think that's up for grabs. I think that's a debatable, debatable claim. It may sound contradictory to some ears, but to show that there's a contradiction there, you need to then get into the nitty gritty of giving me an analysis of free will, which demands that conscious decisions must be, that free decisions must be conscious at the time that they're initiated.